It's time I'm taking a look at Nintendo Power number 41 for October of 1992. We've got another genre-defining title this time, so let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Super Mario Kart, which somewhat brings the kart racing genre from the sort of prototype state it was in with RC Pro-Am into something much more familiar with what we'd see in the future of this genre. In the letters column, the prompt is what legal tactics you'd use to get the money to buy a Super Nintendo. The methods given are not fantastical and are indeed generally practical, with perhaps the sole exception being a kid who suggests selling back their braces for the amount of money which they cost their parents, which is actually pretty funny, as particularly speaking as someone who has had braces in middle school. In the NES section, we begin with a return to Master Higgins with Hudson's Adventure Island 3. We have a rundown of the companion dinosaurs, maps of the first two stages, and notes on stages 3 through 8. Adventure Island 3 plays a lot like Adventure Island 2. You have dinosaur companions, each with their own abilities and attack animations, which will change how you interact with the level, and effectively serve as an additional hit point because, well, they let you take another hit before you die. Additionally, the monsters provide traversal abilities. Classy can be written in water, Red Taylor can stand in lava safety, Don Don flies, and so on. The game also introduces a new weapon, the Boomerang, which can fire in different directions and at longer range, though it has a slightly higher attack arc, so, for example, hitting lower to the ground targets will require you to crouch. The game's fun, and I enjoyed it, but it's, it's another Adventure Island game, so bear that in mind. Power Blade 2, a game which had any anime elements whitewashed away in flavor of 80s testosterone, has gotten a sequel. The screen grabs of the cutscenes look kind of terrible, and the screenshots of the levels don't look so great either. We have notes on the four, four power suits you get in the game, and selections of maps for the first four stages. Well, Power Blade 2 is a game that is better designed than I thought it would be, particularly considering its presentation, and having a decent upgrade system for the weapons and some good controls also helps considerably. It even has some really good level design, with the game's first level doing a good job of giving the player a de facto tutorial on how your stock abilities work, along with encouraging them to experiment with their power suit in the later portion of the level. However, the game's checkpointing is abysmal, with the checkpoint by default being at the start of the level, and only advancing if you beat the somewhat optional mid-boss to get the game level's power suit. It's a decent enough action platformer, and it's certainly much better than I thought it would be, but it doesn't scream like something I need to have as part of my game library. As far as a must-own. After his first outing on the Game Boy, Old Webhead has ha now has his shot on the NES with Return of the Sinister Six. There are notes on Spider-Man's moveset and level maps for the first four stages, along with notes on the boss fights for the very affiliated members of the Sinister Six for those levels. Electro, Sandman, Vulture, and Mysterio. There are some additional notes on the fights for the next two levels, Hobgoblin and Doc Ock. This game is really not very good. It's not that it's that difficult, because it really isn't, in terms of raw difficulty, at least in the early levels. It's that the levels are poorly designed and require a certain degree of pixel bitching and penalties for backtracking that make the game not enjoyable in the least. The fact that the game's graphics feel close to the quality of graphics on the ZX Spectrum doesn't help this game in the slightest. Skip it. In the classified information column, we have some tips on finding a few hidden rooms in Super Smash TV. In the Zelda comic, Link is on his way to the Tower of Ice in the hopes of finding either Zelda or a map of the Dark World. Moving into Game Boy games, we have the port of Bionic Commando for the Game Boy. We get a look at the world map, which hasn't changed much, and maps of some of the early levels which have been redesigned. On the one hand, the presentation for the Game Boy version of Bionic Commando is significantly better, with the game having, well, cutscenes, a la Ninja Gaiden, to, up, to set up the stakes for the game's story. Similarly, the game does a really good job of managing to strike a balance between strikes that sprites that give the characters, well, character, but also allowing a sufficiently large field of view to let you plan ahead and not get caught by surprise. On the other hand, the levels feel smaller and more confined, with the sense of exploration the first game had basically being lessened. I wouldn't mind some sort of hybrid, 
with the anime melodrama narrative presentation of the Game Boy version with the exploration elements of the NES version. Unfortunately, Bionic Commander Rearmed focused more on being tongue-in-cheek, which doesn't give us that ideal hybrid. Next up is Tom and Jerry, an exploration-based platformer where you, as Jerry, have to find Tuffy Mouse before Tom does. This is, unfortunately, a fairly generic platformer with not a lot of verbs for when you navigate the environment. The jumping physics feel loose and your acceleration when moving feels frictionless, which is a problem because the game feels like it requires a certain degree of precision, which is another issue with the game. This is kind of a problem with cartoon-based platformers, of giving the sense of out-of-control movement that the characters had from their respective works, while also allowing the level of precision that most people expect from platformers. Next up is Double Dragon 3, which is a note, because the third title is getting a portable version before the second game did, to my knowledge. This version also takes some cues from River City Ransom, with each level getting a shop where you can buy power-ups, and there are notes on each of the game's levels. The Game Boy version of Double Dragon 3 is a fair brawler, though it runs into problems that the other NES Double Dragon games have had, namely issues with the attack controls. Double Dra Dragon 3 uses separate buttons for punching and kicking, and jump attacks have been tweaked by requiring the player to hit both attack buttons to jump, and then push both buttons again to kick in midair. This makes it more difficult to pull up jump kicks, which is rather unfortunate, as jump kicks are the only really viable method of crowd control, unfortunately. I'd really rather these games just dump the old control screen and had scheme and just had one attack and one jump button, which is, I believe, how Mighty Final Fight handled it, but I don't believe that ever happened. In Super Mario Adventures, Mario and Luigi psychoanalyze the booze in order to get out of the ghost house. And in Counselor's Corner, we have more clues for Link to the Past. Moving into Super Nintendo game coverage, next up is Super Play Action Football, the first Super Nintendo football game, at least featured in this magazine anyway. The game not only has the NFL and NCAA teams, well, NFL and college football teams, they aren't the actual, don't have the actual NCAA license, but they also have a high school sports option with the ability to create your own teams. It is hard to tell what you're supposed to be doing in Super Play Action Football. You can't tell what the names of plays are. You can't tell if you're running a play regular or inverted. You don't know what button or direction combination throws to what receiver, and where along their route the, play, the pass will be when you throw it, so you know when your receiver is in position. For a running play, you have to manually hand the ball off to a player, as opposed to the first game where you just hand it a handoff or lateral automatically. Say what you will about Madden's faults, but one of the things it got right from the beginning is that when you throw a pass, you're throwing it to a receiver. You do not have to steer your receiver with quick reflexes and hit and jump and all that stuff just to make sure that your receiver will actually catch the ball. You take control of the receiver when the receiver has the ball in their hands. That is not the case here. The thing is, I played the hell out of this game at a friend's house when I was a kid. I should be loving this game, but after all these years of playing other better designed football games in terms of controls, the controls on this game don't feel right. So many later football games pulled off the playing of the game of football so much better, even just on this console generation. And arguably, NES play action football handled this better as well. Next up is The Simpsons, Bart's Nightmare, the first Simpsons game for the Super Nintendo, and this is effectively a collection of mini-games with the article covering the basis, basics of each one. Bart's Nightmare is, in short, another terrible Simpsons game in a series of terrible Simpsons games. The concept is neat, a collection of specific levels based on Bart's eternal dream logic, each using the likenesses of Simpsons characters in potentially interesting ways, set through the framing device of a paper Bart's writing. This will provide a way to have a variety of distinct level environments without having to get involved with any of the contrived elements of Bart vs. the World, for example, and would allow developers a way to avoid the environmental monotony of, say, Escape from Camp Deadly. The problem is that the central concept of the game also lends itself to levels with different control schemes which don't necessarily mesh. Further, 
Several of the level designs feature gameplay that is focused more on trial and error and cheap hits than skillful play, with the Bartzilla levels being probably the worst example of this. Temple of Lisa is pretty bad as well, but it does give it does give you some clues when a tile is likely to collapse from underneath you. I really wish we got a good game based on The Simpsons during this time period, during a time when the show was at its peak, as was its popularity, but sadly this is not that game. Next up is our cover title, Super Mario Kart, with a list of the racers and power-ups, along with maps of most of the game's tracks. Super Mario Kart suffers from being the first, the first major kart race, consequently a genre that has been innovated on so tremendously over the years since this game came out, that this game is behind the time and expense. That said, it is a game that plays incredibly well, it doesn't make sense. Next is Out of This World, a rotoscoped adventure platformer like Prince of Persia, but with a science fiction story. There are maps of the first six areas. Out of This World is a game that suffers from not having a manual, in spite of having not very, not very many controller inputs. Part of this is because this game tutorializes for the player poorly. It depends very heavily on engaging in trial and error gameplay in order for the player to figure out what to do next. When trial and error gameplay is done well, when you error, when you goof up, there is information there that you can learn immediately from what you did wrong and why. If you weren't paying attention and missed an audio cue for a creature in Dark Souls, you know when that creature jumps out and gets you, particularly after a time or two, okay, this is a sound that this creature makes. There are creatures of this type populated in this area. I now know what to look for. I now know this creature's attack pattern. For Out of This World, for a few of persons, this works. If you run to the left and leap on the vine, breaking it, it is now unavailable when you're fleeing from the predator later, which becomes clear when you then reach that cliff again and get mauled. That part works. On the other hand, if it is not clear that your ray gun can, well, create a shield, and that you can create multiple shields at once, then at least in the game, without a without a manual, then there's a portion of the game that you can't get past unless you basically go online and look at the fact. Similarly, if the manual has information on how to take out enemies behind a force field, like how many bullets a force field can take, then that also makes things rather difficult. So, there's that. And honestly, you can't guarantee that the player will have a manual for the game, that if a player has, a, has the game secondhand, they might not care of it then, or that the manual has not been misplaced, unless you're dealing with a game which has, well, a big, freaking huge manual, like some PC games do, or some strategy games do. That said, I have no doubt that if I had the time to just sit down and brute force this game, just play through it, die over and over and over again, do a full freaking Game Center CX, Shinra Arena, then I could beat it. And I'd probably have fun figuring out. However, it is an issue that needs to be mentioned. My real complaint, my biggest complaint, is that the narrative of the game is not wrapped up here. It instead concludes in a different title called Heart of the Alien, which was only released for the Sega CD, and, minor spoilers, that game kills off this game's protagonist. So if you'd grown attached to this guy, he's not going to be sticking around much for that game. So there's that narrative issue as well. In Nestor's Adventures, Nestor is playing Prince of Persia. The tip here is to press the attack in sword fights. In the now playing column, among the Ulcerans is Legend of the Ghost Lion, a JRPG with the female protagonist. 
they're also ports of the PC strategy game Overlord. Also, Super Double Dragon and Axelay are included here, in spite of being in fairly significant genres, brawlers and shoot 'em ups respectively, and one being in a major franchise. Hopefully, these will be revisited in a future issue. Next up is the Top 20. The NES Top 20 has basically solidified into what I'd consider people at the time would regard as the NES canon. On the Super Nintendo side, Street Fighter 2 has now entered the Top 5, and Super Battle Tank and Super Star Wars have entered the Top 20. This time, in the celebrity profile, Ken Griffey Jr. is featured. I suspect that this is because this is at the round around the time that Nintendo bought partial ownership of the Seattle Mariners, ownership that, as of this recording, they have divested themselves of, so the story here is less, well, the profiled player of the story, and more the circumstances as to why they're featured in the magazine. The Gaming Historian did an excellent episode on Ken Griffey Jr., well, it's much Griffey Jr., but Nintendo's ownership of the Mariners. I will link to that in the show notes, and I strongly recommend that you watch it. In Pack Watch, there's a look at Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, a game meant to be an introduction to JRPGs, which the description tries to get across. This is not a for veterans kind of thing. This is for newbies, neophytes. In the Japan Watch section, the feature title this time is Kairu, and I'm mangling that name, K-A-E-R-U, for the Game Boy, which is described as another JRPG. The game engine from this title, doing a little research, was apparently later used for... Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, and this game has received a translation patch, making it Retron 5 friendly, so let's take a look at that. Kairu, or Kairu, I don't know how I'm to probably pronounce this, unfortunately, plays like a mixture of Legend of Zelda 1 and 2 and Princess Tomato in the Salad Kingdom. Like Legend of Zelda, you explore the world, picking up items to gain new traversal abilities and improve your power set. It has top-down and side-scrolling perspective like the first two Legend of Zelda games, though it doesn't have a level-up mechanic like Zelda 2. Battles basically fight themselves, and like in Princess Tomato, if you've got the right attack items and power, you'll just win fights. Upgrading a weapon one tier will allow you to instantly defeat enemies that you had to actually battle before, and let you f battle enemies you couldn't fight otherwise. Power upgrades allow you to do more damage, so you can take on more enemies before you have to heal. Otherwise, since there are no level-up mechanics, there is no grinding. It's a fun game, and it plays well, and I'm kind of surprised why the title didn't get a US release. My clear pick of this week, the classic of this issue, is Super Mario Kart Beyond a Doubt. As far as my other pick is concerned, I really want my pick of the week to be out of this world. But I care a lot about game narrative, and the fact that this game is something of a non-ending, with a bit of a downer payoff in the sequel, one that's on a completely different platform, makes me less inclined to give it a wholehearted recommendation. Instead, I'm going to go with Bionic Commando for the Game Boy. It's one of the best Game Boy titles I've covered thus far, and if you want more gameplay like the first game, it's definitely worth picking up. Now, if you have a Retron 5, I would recommend picking up Kareru, as it's got a translation patch, so you can legally play it in English, and it's it's fun. It's, it's very... You know, Legend of Zelda meets, well, Princess Tomato, which is kind of cool. Next issue, we're going back in time, a long time ago, to a galaxy far, far away with Super Star Wars. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. 
Backing the show can get you a mention in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.